Welcome back, everybody, to some Grand Tactician Civil War. We're going to go ahead and try again to do a campaign. I'm going to be playing as the Union starting in 1862. And uh, a couple of reasons for that. Number one, the 1861 uh, campaign still has some issues to be worked out, and I believe the next patch is going to deal with some of those things. Uh, but one of the ongoing things, besides the attrition from rain, which we've been affectionately calling acid rain because it causes 100 times the casualties that it should, but also there seems to be an issue with supply. Uh, no matter what I do, my Army of Northeastern Virginia never seems to be able to stay in supply even when it's constructed and sitting in Washington, D.C. So I think those are things that need to be worked out. Remember, this game is still in early access. It's got a long way to go. Uh, it seems much more stable to start in spring of 1862, which I know is not preferable. Uh, it's nice to be able to build your army from the ground up. Uh, but we're going to go with this. Uh, we're going to take on the Union, but I've decided to give the Confederacy a, tw a plus 20 bonus. You can go anywhere from zero to plus 50, I believe. So I thought until we figure out what's a good place, 20 seems like a good middle ground. Same with AI aggressiveness. Uh, you can be 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x. And so, for example, on AI aggressiveness 3x, I noticed right away that the Confederacy in the 1861 campaign sends its small fledgling navy to try and blockade Washington, D.C.'s port. Uh, so that's just a difference that you see in the aggressiveness. So I thought 3x is a nice middle ground. That way he'll be proactive. He'll try to do some things and it'll kind of keep me on my toes a little bit more. So let's go ahead and dive into this campaign. We'll see how far we can go with it today. First of all, uh, before we get any further, I want to let you know that the first thing I'm going to do is start adding the patron units. I want to get those in there as quickly as possible. And yesterday, with the uh, release of this game uh, in early access, we had a huge influx, not only of new subscribers to the channel, new folks on Discord, but also new patrons. We went from 29 patrons to 39 yesterday, 10 new patrons. So I want to say welcome. And thank you to every one of you, whether you are brand new or have been a longtime supporter of this channel. Uh, it's the folks not only on Patreon, but all of you who watch these videos and like and subscribe and comment who make this possible. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday in the live stream, this is my job right now um, with most schools not doing assemblies uh, in the fall, uh, my income for the year is just gone. Um, I make about a third of my entirely entire yearly income just in September and October from speaking in schools, and that is a no-go right now. Uh, normally, this time, I'd be traveling already. So uh, every bit you guys do to help is uh, making a huge difference for me and my family, so thank you for that. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to do the patron units first. I'm going to start throwing those in. I haven't heard back from everybody yet, but the ones I have heard back from, I'm going to start adding you. Uh, I'm not going to show you every one of those uh, as I do it, but I'm going to go ahead and add them, and then I'll review those for you and show you what armies, what divisions they're all in. Okay, our first three are going in the Army of the Ohio. And what we have here are the 95th Rifles. Uh, that is a request by Keith Kripe. So there you go, uh, Keith, uh, Indiana unit. Uh, green uniforms, Springfield rifled muskets, ready to go. Uh, we have Mills Brigade. That's Zach Mills. Thank you so much, Zach, for your continued support. Uh, they are also are in this Army, and then they're from Illinois. And then the last unit, also from Indiana, that's going to be added to the Army of the Ohio is Bravo Battery 218th Field Artillery with their blue jackets, red pants. That's Red Leg 13B. Thank you, guys. Let's move on. Okay, so here are the next three. We've got the Montero Rifles with their green jackets uh, and gray pants that's for terrence so thank you terrence uh, we also have this is an entirely new division and that is not william tecumseh sherman that's thomas sherman uh, the first guardsman uh, and that is a unit for kyler who's one of our newest patrons thank you for that kyler your blue uniforms and then under abner doubleday the guards brigade and that is for graham brown who's been a longtime uh, patron of this channel uh, so i'm going to go ahead and start moving uh, the pieces are on the board so to speak uh, we are going to add some additional units uh, but i want to kind of get to the action a little bit and then we'll continue with the patron units so looking at our strategy uh, west virginia uh, is something that we need to control. So uh, capturing Wheeling, Grafton, and Charleston will help form West Virginia as a state loyal to the Union and demoralize the CSA. So I feel like that's something I want to uh, pursue right now. Also, control of the Mississippi is vital right now. So holding Memphis, Vicksburg, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans will motivate the Union public and national morale will increase by 10. So those are two of my priorities right now. 
Uh, we also obviously need to crush Robert E. Lee. Well, Joseph Johnston in the East. It's not Robert E. Lee yet, and it may not end up being Robert E. Lee. And we need to continue the uh, stranglehold through the blockade. Uh, these circles, if you're wondering what those are, uh, that's something I have turned on on the map. That's actually uh, where the telegraph lines are. Uh, so that kind of gives us a little bit of an idea of where we have telegraph and where we don't. Because uh, eventually we're going to want to have telegraph everywhere so we can get very rapid movement on our units. Uh, let's look over here. I think this is the 7th Division. Uh, I think we're going to need to add some units uh, to that one uh, just to kind of guard against the Army of East Tennessee because they do have 11,000 men. Uh, so let's see if we can add a Kentucky unit uh, to that division. Uh, it's a single... Uh, kind of solitary army with no divisions in it, which makes it really difficult to maneuver in the field. So I don't really like that, but it doesn't look like we have enough troops to add a Kentucky unit. So we're gonna, I wanna try to add somebody who's not too far away. So let's go Michigan. Um, I'll go ahead and just do kind of the standard uniform. We'll add 3,000 men. That should be enough. It's gonna take 11 days for them to get there. We have 6,000 men in the Mountain Department under John C. Fremont, and I think these are probably the men with which we are going to try to uh, deal with West Virginia. We've got to take Charleston and Grafton. I'm going to send the Mountain Department to deal with uh, Charleston. It may not be enough men to get that done, so I feel like I probably want to add uh, somebody to that unit as well. If we add even one brigade, that'll give us 3,000 more men. Ohio seems to make sense here. So let's go ahead and add 3,000 Ohio boys to that unit. That'll give us 9,000 men. And then I think I can probably spare at least one of the Corps from the Army of the Potomac. Looks like the Army uh, of Virginia is pulling everybody back. Hill's Corps is going toward Richmond. Uh, looks like he's trying to consolidate his forces. But that means that Jackson's basically giving up West uh, Winchester to us. Uh, so I'm going to move the 5th Corps toward Grafton. Move the third corps, twenty-four thousand men under Colonel Sam, uh, under Samuel Heitzelman. Uh, we're going to move them in toward West uh, Winchester. See if we can take that. All right, here comes the aggressive Confederacy. The first corps of the Army of Mississippi. How many men does he have there? Only eight, eighty-seven hundred men is moving toward me. I don't know if the rest of the Army of Mississippi is behind that or not. It looks like he is trying to move aggressively north. But the problem is he doesn't have the other ones in range. I think I can isolate this first corps and take them out. I wasn't planning on moving the Army of Tennessee, Army of the Tennessee until I uh, got my new units that are going to be added to that unit. But I feel like this is an opportunity that I can't pass up. We're on an offensive stance. It looks like he's moving toward Nashville. So we're going to start sending Grant down there to intercept him. Let's take a look at them real quick. I'm sure I don't have all of my new units yet. Yeah, we're eight days away with the Montero Rifles, five days away with the 1st Guardsmen, and nine days away with the Guards Brigade. Okay, it looks like he's he's moving a little quicker than I thought he would. His third corps is there. His reserve corps is there. Uh, what we want to do now is we want to make sure that Buell... Okay, Buell's also also on offensive stance because what that's going to mean is it's going to allow both of my armies to be involved in this action. As long as they're on offensive stance, then uh, some of you have asked about these things. The inside circle is the the circle in which they will engage an enemy force that gets within that range. The outer circle is the one in which they will march to the sound of the guns if they're on an offensive stance. So in this outer circle, you see in the Army of the Ohio, if the Army of the Ohio gets engaged in combat, the Army of the Tennessee being within that circle for the Army of the Ohio, uh, which is a smaller circle in this case, uh, they will march to the sound of the guns and help. Okay, here we go. It looks like the 3rd Corps of the Army of Mississippi is in contact with the Army of the Ohio. This is where our first combat is going to take place. Uh, it's going to be taking place. At, it's going to be called the Battle of Nashville. Uh, probably on the Shiloh map, but could be Stones River. I guess we'll see. 
All right, so let's see what the current situation is, but also what we could be facing by the time it's over. Uh, so it's actually a pretty small force at the moment, uh, 18,000, 19,000 men uh, for me, about 8,000 for the Confederacy, but we're going to see reinforcements pouring into this fight, no doubt. So it is Murfreesboro, so this is the Stones River battlefield. Uh, they are, if you look at the, the road map, uh, now that they've done early release, uh, the very next thing, main thing they're going to be working on is the first map pack. Uh, and they are eventually going to be adding random kind of generic maps that aren't a specific battlefield. Uh, so they're not all going to be fought on historic battles, uh, battlefields eventually. Uh, but for now, that's what we're doing. Alexander McCook, he's a Northeast Ohio guy. Uh, I live about 45 minutes from the McCook house. That whole family um, ended up with a bunch of high-ranking officers during the war. Uh, here's Wood's division. I'm just trying to clear things out here so it's a little easier to see where everything is, and then we'll kind of organize from there. Okay, whole Army of the Ohio right here. So um, what do we want to do? Man, if we can come in, it looks like he's already up here. Uh, so we're probably not going to be able to stop him at the crossing, so we need to look for the next best thing. I'm kind of just trying to decide where's a good spot to put my battle lines. Let's see. It looks like there may be some good terrain here. I'm thinking maybe maybe along this hill, this uh, kind of crest right here where the uh, church is, that looks like this might be a good spot to place an army. Let's get them all on that side of the creek. All right, and I'm going to start giving them orders, but then I'll be more specific with my orders once we get a little further along. Where did I say I was going? Okay, it's over here. This looks like a good good spot to have an army. We just got a notification that John C. Breckenridge arrived with some forces, so let's see how that changes the situation. All right, that changes it dramatically. That doubles the number of men he has on the field. So now it's at 19,000 for me and 16,000 for him. Uh, it's kind of what I expected, and I imagine that will continue as more and more... Uh, reinforcements arrive on the field. This is going to turn into a major action. Oh boy, we just got another notification. Polk's Corps has arrived. Now we're outnumbered. So, boy, I hope my reinforcements start arriving real soon. All right, and here he comes. Looks like he's going to be slamming into my left flank to start. I may need to shift myself a little bit or at least pull this force back, but he does look like he's coming around on this side as well. But I guess we're going to find out here in a minute whether my deployment was a sound one or not. Oh, he's trying to get around me, and I don't have the troops to really counter that. Uh, okay, he's 24,000. That's These are estimated numbers, so they're going to fluctuate. Uh, based on the situation, more importantly, he's got 80 guns to my 16, and that's an issue. Man, if he gets around, he can't get around too far to my flank because the river butts right up against that. Uh, but what I may need to do is pull Garish back, put him up on this high ground right here. That's uh, not quite where we want him. A little more like that. Okay, here he comes. He's coming through the woods. I had a chance to kind of place myself exactly where I wanted to within what was feasible. Uh, I've got orders to engage at medium range, which would be about 150 yards. So it's not quite don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes, but it's also not don't just start firing the second you see them. We at least want to get it a decent, accurate shot. These woods do make it a little difficult for my artillery to operate. And uh, I did want to back up at least far enough to where he would have to come into the clearing before he could fire on me and he couldn't just hide in the edge of the woods. I don't know why this last brigade hasn't pulled back uh, to the position that I gave him. Oh, no, that's not. These guys are the ones that I pulled back. And it looks like he's still crossing. So he's probably trying to get all the way up here and around my flank, which is really impressive uh, for the AI if that's what he chooses to do. Looks like he's engaging me with his artillery. He's got a huge advantage in artillery in this battle. Uh, and that's one of my biggest concerns right now. 
that, and I wish I had some cavalry to kind of watch his movements to see what he's doing. What do we got here? 12 pounder Napoleons. Man, I really kind of feel like I ought to send one brigade up just to see what's happening because I don't want him showing up, kind of Stonewall Jackson, <laughs> showing up with a whole core on my flank over here. Well, my concern about a flank attack was well-founded. I just was looking at the wrong flank. I sent a brigade up here to keep an eye out for an attack on that side. And lo and behold, look, he's got cavalry and even some artillery coming up on this side. Uh, so let's rush Sanders Bruce over there real quick. He's probably not going to get there in time to stop that. I think there's a way to do a forced march. Yeah, double time, boys. But first, we've got to get the orders to him to do it. Uh, looks like this is all just a feint at my front to keep me guessing while he comes around the flanks. And if that's the case, well, I hate it for the sake of my army. I love it for the sake of this game because that's exactly the kind of thing you want to see happen. Well, my concern about a flank attack was well-founded. I just was looking at the wrong flank. I sent a brigade up here to keep an eye out for an attack on that side. And lo and behold, look, he's got cavalry and even some artillery coming up on this side. Uh, so let's rush Sanders Bruce over there real quick. He's probably not going to get there in time to stop that. I think there's a way to do a forced march. Yeah, double time, boys. But first, we've got to get the orders to him to do it. It uh, looks like this is all just a feint at my front to keep me guessing while he comes around the flanks. And if that's the case, well, I hate it for the sake of my army. I love it for the sake of this game because that's exactly the kind of thing you want to see happen. Well, this is an absolute disaster in the making for me. And I couldn't be more thrilled about it. <laughs> I know that's weird to say, but, uh, you know, this game has been getting a bit of a bad rap for the AI and some of it justified. But this is a good good look here that they're doing this. Uh, a, a sneak flank attack where I had no cavalry to screen to see what was going on. I had no idea that he was coming. That shows you the need for things like cavalry. It shows you the importance of keeping an eye on your flanks. And it shows you that even um, on this game, the AI can surprise you. And maybe it's the aggressiveness setting that people need to be dealing with. Uh, this is my first battle fought in a campaign with aggressiveness set to three and it definitely seems to be making a difference and I don't know what I'm going to do but I may I may lose the whole army of the Ohio here because uh, I'm still he's still just kind of floating around in front here uh, making me wonder if he's going to attack there and I, I've got to suddenly start throwing units back this way and you know I, I sat there and thought okay this is a good spot between the two rivers he'll have to attack me from the front Never really considered that he would just go around the wings and hit me that way. And I'm paying for it. We are starting to rush some brigades over this way to deal with this. You'll notice that, you know, when I go to give the order, the initial order has them kind of taking the high ground or cover. But if you hold down that shift button, it'll just do a standard battle line. All right, so we're basically sending what amounts to a whole division over here, three brigades from different divisions, just to kind of cover things a little bit. But he's already across the river. Sanders Bruce, you know what, let's get some... Some skirm oh, it's too late for skirmishers now. I'm gonna bring the eleventh brigade in on his right. And they're gonna bring the fifth brigade over here to this side.
So they're detached, they're cut off, so that hurts. It's their first combat experience. And they are dealing with flanking fire. I'm not sure where from, it might be the artillery. Here comes the courier to give these guys their new orders to move up. This is the problem with having them from different divisions is it's gonna, the orders are gonna be a bit of an issue. All right, let's go ahead and back up and see. Okay, now I got a unit with its flank hanging out here and he's got skirmishers coming that way. So we've got to back up and deal with that. These guys are sitting tight right here. Let's go ahead and maybe throw them up and they can put in a little enfilade fire in the meantime. Any of my reinforcements on the way? No. I'm still sitting tight without it. All right, he appears to be moving in on my left now. We've got Amon's detachment of skirmishers out front. They're the only ones that are actually in range right now of any combat. I probably should pull him back, but I do like having this high ground here. In fact, what I may do is just bring Garfield up to support and we'll keep keep Smith where he is for now. And it looks like he's starting to cross. So he's once again attacking my flanks. And he's got his artillery there to support. That worries me because the center unit's already kind of weak. I probably should have moved these guys up a little bit so I could hit them as they were crossing. And I should probably do this at long range too. send out some skirmishers from all of these units. There we go. We'll keep them, keep them guessing that way. Casualty situation looking pretty good. About two to one casualties at the moment. That's what we like to see, especially with even numbers. All right. Looks like Jacob Amon's brigade has also added a perk. Um, we'll do expert skirmishers. Especially since we have skirmishers currently deployed from him. Um, he, he is starting to try to get out on my flank over here. So let's try to counter that and get Boyle moving. The problem, of course, as I've mentioned already, is um, orders are a little tough in coming uh, because of the way that I've got my, my units set up. Rather than having them in divisions as I should. I, I kind of had to piecemeal throw folks from different divisions to different places. So my division commanders are kind of all over the place, which means it's going to take a while for orders to get where they need to be. Oil has leveled up. So his first ones happen pretty fast once they get into combat. I think we're going to be okay in this battle. What is this? Oh, it's just Asbury Church being taken again. Uh, still about 2 to 1 on the casualties. 3 to 1 on wounded. 7% for him, only 3% for me. That's good news. He just hasn't really committed to an attack. And I remember part of that is this is the West. And the Confederate commanders in 1862 in the West not as good as the Union, uh, whereas it was the opposite in the East. So I would expect to see the Eastern armies to perform considerably better than the ones out West, and that could be part of the reason why we're not seeing a real solid attack happening. Right, we got to pull Amon's skirmishers back because they're taking a lot of casualties there. Where 
whereas these skirmishers are doing pretty good. In fact, let's go ahead and move the brigades up so we can retake that position. I think we're pretty solid here. We can just kind of sit tight for a while. Looks like some of his units are starting to withdraw. We'll see how that affects the numbers. Now he's down to just 20,000 men. I'm going to go ahead and bring Hazen back down from his kind of flank position there, covering that flank, because it seems like nothing's happening up there. So I'm going to bring Hazen in right next to Amon on this hill on this side. I'm hoping we can get to the end of the day so I can redeploy and get my units back in divisions. Uh, just kind of hold the same position, but get divisions with each other. But you can see now he's starting to cross again. He's finally getting all of his units across, something he probably should have done a long time ago. Let's go ahead and put Kirk's detachment of skirmishers out here on our flank. We don't want to run into an issue where he exploits this gap in my line right here, which is exactly what he appears to be doing. Again, the wise move in this situation. So what we're going to have to do is see if we can pull Boyle over there to plug that gap. Let's see if that works. Again, it's going to take some time because Boyle's division commander is over here. You can see Garish has one brigade here, one in the center, one on the right. We're really just spread out in awful ways. This is not an ideal situation for command and control. All right, I guess now I'm kind of wishing Boyle had stayed where he is. It looks like those skirmishers may be okay to cover that. He still hasn't received his orders. But that's a good thing because now he threw these guys back. It's 3.16 in the afternoon. Still better than 2 to 1 casualties. 16% now for the Confederates who are down to just 15,000 men effective. You can see additional units withdrawing for him. I think we've got this battle. And it wasn't looking good for a while there. How are we doing on ammunition? Actually, pretty good. We still got 53 here. Kirk's men, oh, they just broke. I was just about to give them their upgrade, too. Okay. So he really loaded up on Kirk, and we paid for it. So that's our first unit to break from the field. Now I'm starting to wonder who I can pull over there. Looks like Wagner might be my best bet. They haven't been engaged at all so far. So let's throw Wagner over there. See if that'll help. Nice thing about having these interior lines, I can kind of do this a little better than he can because he's out on the outside kind of surrounding me. These guys are just sitting tight, keeping me occupied. All right, Wagner's about to get in position. There go my... Who's that? That's Kirk's skirmishers. Let's just reattach them if we can. Oh, Kirk, Kirk was the one who already fl fled, so it makes sense for his skirmishers to do the same. Let's go ahead and reattach these skirmishers. Just let our brigades do the fighting now. Okay. Still really, really good on casualties. 20% for him. He's down to just 14,000 men. I think that was his last gasp crossing here. We'll go ahead and speed things up a little bit. How are we doing, Boyle? His problem is he's detached from his command and control. More his units withdrew. 
leaving him. I know he's still at 14,000. That was some of my units, too. Oh, no. Bruce just broke. Oh, he's wearing me down on that side. Didn't see that coming. Seems like no matter who I have in the center, it's a problem. What can I do now? Because he's really just pressing this attack. Wagner's lost 251 men. Boyle's only lost 86. Wagner's my next concern. You know what? They're not even firing at the range they could right now. So I'm going to bring a battery over. Mendenhall's six-pounder wired rifles. These are not the best guns, but they're better than no guns, which is what I currently have over here. So it's late in the day now. I wanted them to go up a little farther than that. I want to get them in canister range if I can. There we go. Let's right, look at the numbers now. All right, we're pretty much even because I had several units break now as well, but the casualties are still pretty favorable to me. I think his huge advantage in artillery is what caused some of these units to break over here. Wagner is determined in morale, so that's good. Good cohesion, well rested. These guys are strong in melee. Um, some status engaged, no cover, nervous morale, that's a problem. Surprised he isn't bringing Russell up. That's a 2,200 man brigade that could be firing on me over here. I don't really know who else I can possibly bring over from somewhere. We could bring Smith over. Oh, there goes Boyle. I was afraid of that. He was the unit that was nervous. Oh, we've reached the end of the day. So at least now I have an opportunity to redeploy with who's left now you can see a bunch more units have fled the field so i don't even know what we're still facing at this point on each side oh reinforcements have arrived that's what these are these are people fleeing these are people arriving Grant's army of the tennessee has arrived on the field folks well it took them all night but here they are we have a surprise in the morning so i, I you know i think to the battle of shiloh and in that case, it was Grant's army that was being pressed, and he was waiting for Buell's army to arrive. So it's the opposite situation here. And at the end of that night, Grant had been uh, injured from a, a horse falling on him. I probably severely sprained his ankle. And uh, so he's kind of resting under a tree, and Sherman comes up to him and says, Well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day. And Grant said, and this is one of my favorite qu quotes of Grant, he says, Yep. Lick them tomorrow, though, and that's exactly what's going to happen here. So let's get this army in position and crush this Confederate army. Okay, here we go. So poor Thomas Sherman here, he's broken because he has no men yet. That's the unit that uh, I'm putting all those new patron units in, uh, the division, and none of them have arrived yet. So he's showing as kind of a broken, empty division because that's what he is at the moment. All right, so we're going to send... Uh, George Thomas and Stephen Hurlbutt down through the center with their units. Let's send William Tecumseh Sherman up here uh, to surprise these guys right there. We'll go ahead and send, who's this, W.H.L. Wallace, who uh, historically was killed at the Battle of Shiloh, and uh, Grant spoke very highly of him. Not so much about Lou Wallace, who uh, Grant was not pleased with his performance at Shiloh, and that's unfortunate. My my ancestor was in the 20th Ohio, which was a part of Lou Wallace's division at Shiloh. And then we've got our artillery, which is under Benjamin Prentice. We'll go ahead and start moving that up to the center as well. 
We just need these guys to hold now. I, I should have redeployed these divisions, and I forgot to do that to get them all sorted in their proper divisions, but we'll just keep them where they are. We're going to let Grant do the work here. Did I give McLernan orders? No, let's go ahead and give him orders as well. This is going to be fun. get Veach and Lauman into position here. I guess we'll probably go ahead and just have them kind of cover the crossing. Who's in behind them? Nelson Williams. We'll do the same here. They'll keep this brigade or this division occupied while we get everybody else across. Boyle continues to break up there. That's okay. Help is on the way. Yeah, WHL Wallace is going to come up here and take this objective. All right, we should be engaging here. We're not so far. Now we are. All right, let's speed things along a little bit. Get those two divisions down here. They're just going to completely route this Confederate force when they get there. I guess we should make sure the Confederates aren't getting any new help. No, they haven't. They're down to 13,000 men. All right, we've broken part of uh, Chatham's division. Actually, all of Chatham's division. Here comes the surprise to spring. I thought I gave orders for our artillery to move up. Oh, we have two units of artillery, don't we? That's why. Two divisions of artillery in this army. I like putting the ar the artillery separate because then you can it's easier to build to get your battle lines for infantry. Like so. And then you can place your artillery separate. It just means a little bit longer with orders when you have to order all the individual batteries. Who was wounded? Joseph Reynolds, commander of the 1st Division, has been wounded. Alright, so what we need to do now is get George Thomas to come up and crush this crush these guys once and for all. So we'll bring him in over on this flank here and then we'll come right at him over there. Let's go ahead and get Garish lined up on this side. All right, um, McLernand, let's get you across with your division. Just go ahead and destroy these guys. Same with Sherman. I'm just going to march them right across. They can get into melee combat. There's only one brigade and a battery still over here. And then once we clear out the flanks, then we'll go at what's left of the center. 
Just 12,000 men left now. Let's go ahead and slow things down so I can at least see what's happening. Now we're the ones doing the crossing. Oh, we got a rivalry. Crittenden demoralized. Oh, Crittenden, you know what? You just got here. These guys in Buell's army have been holding out against crazy odds. Well, I shouldn't say crazy odds, but a difficult attack. And then you just arrive on the field and you're going to do that. All right. We're almost there. Who's he got left now? Uh, still 12,000 men. The odds are a little more even as far as the killed casualties go. But that's because I've gotten a little more aggressive in trying to crush him. All right, George Thomas is just about in a position where we want him now. Let's go ahead and press this attack. We'll move Garrish up and do the same. We're having a little trouble getting across here. Where's McCook? Let's move his whole division forward now. All right, I think we're ready for George Thomas to do his thing here. We got to get him just a little further forward, though. Let's go ahead and give them orders for long range firing. All right, Thomas, do your thing. Grant thought highly of Thomas, put him in command of the uh, army. I think the army of the Mississippi? No, the army of the Cumberland. Yeah. He put him in command of that army after Chickamauga. sure why Peabody's facing that way. There we go. Alright. Can we please get our boys across over here? Because their morale is just terrible this way. Whose division is that? And why aren't we getting them across? Sherman. Come on, Sherman. Get your boys out there. Oh, they were in melee combat still, that's why. All right, so the combined forces of George Thomas and George Garish ought to be able to deal with this once and for all. So the Confederates flashed a few moments of brilliance with their strategy, uh, but then they didn't commit to it fully. And so I don't know if that's the game or if that's just their commanders. I want to say it's their commanders because the fact that they did it in the first place shows me something about what the game AI can do. So we'll see how this ends up. Okay, well, it looks like it, he withdrew. So there you see the final numbers. 7,500 casualties for the Confederates, 4,600 on my side. The timely arrival of Grant's army to turn the tide. So a major federal victory, and I think that's probably a good spot uh, to wrap up. We'll at least go ahead and take a look and see uh, what generals may have um, earned fame for themselves or infamy, depending on how things happen. Usually there's somebody that um, that's praised and someone who is not. Uh, but the rest of you who are patrons, I will get your units in in the next episode. There is a post over on Patreon asking for everybody just to reply if you're at that captain level or higher. 
uh, to let me know what your unit preference is. Some of you have messaged me with those, and that's fine too. Uh, so I'll try to keep track of those. We'll get the rest of them in on the next episode, and hopefully in the next episode we'll see the others in action for the first time. So here now we'll get to see the results. Um, enemy's national morale dropped by 0.07. Our military experience rises by 0.04. Due to his battle honors, Colonel Veach has become famous and inspiration for his men. He's the one who crossed the bridge there on day two and kind of helped uh, kind of clear the way for uh, Thomas's division to get across and get into combat. So, uh, so Veach is the one who gets the fame in this case. It doesn't look like anybody is going to be... Um, derided in the press for their performance. Nope, no negative performances on this one. So the glorious victory at Nashville, third corps fleeing in panic. Colonel Veach becomes a national hero. All Colonel Stevens loses face. So it didn't tell me that on that screen, but extra extra news from the front lines is renewed carefully, reviewed carefully by the citizenship and the nature of the news has an impact on their support of the war effort. Uh, so here you have all of the information. That's really cool. I love that kind of aspect of things. Uh, there you see the enemy's casualties uh, compared to ours. We've captured 1,143 and eight, I guess, eight guns from the battlefield. So very cool. We're going to pause it right there. Let me know your thoughts. Use that comment section below. Drop a like if you would, and we'll be back every single day with new episodes. Thanks for watching.